Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mental Health TV. We're really pleased to have you with us tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, mental health and humour, which is going to be an interesting one, I think. So obviously, I'm Nikki. Um, let me just pass you over to Dave before we get started so he can tell you how you can join in, ask questions. Um, generally, yeah, participate. Dave. Hi, everyone. And yeah, welcome to tonight's MHTV. Uh, I am not Vanessa again. Uh, I, I don't know how many episodes I'll do this where I might turn into Vanessa, but it's not yet. Uh, so unfortunately, Vanessa can't join us tonight. So I have come in as substitute uh, and I'll be doing social media. So all our regular watchers will know that we love to hear from you, your comments, your questions. Uh, all you need to do is either post on the Facebook live chat uh, and obviously we'll pick up that or you can tweet us. All you need to do is use the has hashtag MHTV. Uh, and we'll see them as well. Uh, and it'd be great to get some of your comments uh, into tonight's episode. I know I'm really looking forward to what we've got in front of us. So oh, back over to you, Nikki. Fantastic. All right, Matt, please, will you introduce yourself? Tell, tell us about who you are and what your interest is in, in sure. mental health and humour. Sure. Thanks, Nikki. Well, um, hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Matt Graham, and I'm Senior Lecturer in Social Work at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston. Um, and I've been uh, working at UCLan um, for the last five years and then prior to that I worked at other universities as a, as a lecturer in social work and then prior to that I was a, a mental health social worker in practice and many years ago I was something called an approved social worker and um, for me humour has always been really important on a kind of a personal and a professional level really because um, I think humour sustains us and, and it keeps us going and it gives us uh, enjoyment and pleasure and it's a bit edgy sometimes um, and for my sins, I uh, decided um, to do a, a PhD or start a PhD a couple of years ago where I'm looking at uh, particularly the subject of humour in education and how humour is understood by academics. So what purpose does humour serve in relation to uh, um, you know, teaching methods and, and communicating important subjects? Um, and I like a good laugh as well, really. I'm not, I'm not funny though, Nikki. It's, it's important to remember, I, I'm not a funny person. I'm not a comedian, even though I like humour. You know, mm -hmm. just because you're doing a, a, a PhD in humour and thinking about humour doesn't mm -hmm. always make me um, someone who can crack jokes. So please don't ask me to tell a joke. Or a <laughs> well, we'll see how we go. We'll see how we go. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about why, why you think humour is so central and such an interesting or key topic. Well, I mean... That's, Humour is something we can all relate to, um, whether we um, find ourselves to be people who enjoy humour or not. I mean, humour serves a, a function. Mm. Um, it, um, you know, the way I often see it is that humour has this kind of biopsychosocial function in as much that, mm. you know, we, we biologically react to humour. We, we all mm. laugh at things. Um, no one really quite knows what causes laughter or, or why we laugh. It's something that mm. scientists have been trying to work out for for generations really but you know mm. laughter does a couple of really important things it it, it it makes us feel good it releases endorphins into our brains it gives us a bit of a high um it makes us um feel happy um and because of that it improves our mental health and, and you know along with that you know if you're thinking about actually um, having a laugh with people it connects people so it has a social structure as well as much as a, a biological and a psychological component mm. to it um, and, you know, everyone has a view on humour. I mean, particularly mm. at the moment, you know, humour sustains many of us, I think, during yeah. this pandemic and, and, and during lockdown. Um, and everyone has a, a view on what is offensive in humour or what is an OK joke to tell or not to tell. So I think regardless of, of, of you know, 
whether or not you um, are someone who likes telling jokes or likes mm-hmm. having a laugh or likes to be a bit more serious about things, we all have an opinion on what humour is. So mm-hmm. I, I was really interested um, when it came up as a, as a topic. I was discussing it with a, a couple of my colleagues at UCLan who came up with the idea that's perhaps what I should look at. And I thought, actually, that would be a really interesting topic because mm-hmm. um, it's something I think we all engage with at, on some level at some point. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you, I guess you're too new to have any kind of, sort of findings or first thoughts on how it's been used in sort of education or health education. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's, there's a lot of literature out there about it. I mean, I think humour is used a lot in education. It's used to, um, I think, soften complex messages sometimes. It's, it's used to portray information in a way that people can relate to. Um, it breaks the ice. You know, we all have these things called icebreakers, even though I'm not a fan of icebreakers per se before sessions, because they're always a bit awkward, you know. But I think it does, you know, it does something to make you feel a bit human, really. And, um, you know, we all like to watch something or learn from somebody who can make us laugh. You know, we all like a good laugh, don't we, really? And, and you know, I, I, I really enjoy trying to use humour I'm not always good at it and there are times I have completely died on my backside when I've <laughs> used humour in teaching um, but I think it's a way that it you know it, it's a way of engaging people and it's yeah. and, and sometimes things are just funny aren't they there's naturally funny to laugh about something um, being mindful um, yeah. of what we laugh at yeah tell us a little bit more maybe about that the idea about there being benefits and, and maybe some issues professionally speaking, with human, using humour? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I suppose when I think about humour, there's, there's kind of two sh- types of humour, I suppose. There's what we might call adaptive humour and, and mm. maladaptive humour. And, and for me, kind of, you know, adaptive humour is humour that kind of, you know, has an affiliation that, that connects you with people. Um, and if someone finds something funny, you know, that, that that's a that's a good thing because actually, you know, you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, I can engage with that person. I can relate to that person. Um, they have the same sense of humour as me and that, that works. And in education, it kind of, you know, it connects you with students. You know, it's, it's a good way of, um, you know, um, I suppose aligning with students on a particular subject. Mm. But you I mean, like all things really, you've, you've got to watch it because what you might find funny, others might not find funny. And that's when it trips over into what we might call maladaptive humour, um, which kind of can be aggressive humour. It can be kind of self, um, self-defeating self humour um, and humour that some people might find um, unpleasant, you know. Mm. And if you're laughing at people rather than laughing with people, that can be slightly awkward, even though some people actually might like being laughed at because sometimes it can be funny if, something, you know, if somebody does something wrong or something goes wrong. Mm. Um, you know that can be amusing um, so I think you know it it, it, it has to be considered carefully um, mm. I mean I remember I, I was um, invigilating a, an exam and the chair that I was sitting on collapsed it just completely broke um, and everyone in the room just laughed um, some people thought actually can I laugh at that or not laugh at that and actually I thought it was really funny and I laughed and the person who I was invigilating with had to leave the room because they thought mm. it was hilarious um, mm. but what was interesting was I, I, I looked at the stu- some of the students in the room some people laughed and others just looked at me awkwardly thinking if I laugh will that mean that I'm going to get in some kind of trouble because I laughed because his chair broke mm. so again you know, it's a psychological thing because some people sort of say well actually can I can I join in with that or is it not mm. safe to join in with that? You know, what, what's the kind of barometer mm. that I have to check out? You said about four or five really things that are just like bouncing out to me. Do you mind if we to stop and go back? Yeah, think, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. So one of the things is when you when we um, make an affiliation with someone because they have the same sense of humour as us, because that's a really interesting thing, isn't it? I, you hear that all the time. So I love saying they have the same sense of humour, so they laugh at the same stuff as me. But it's it's not really just about humour, is it? It's it's a match of culture and values and personality. Yeah, yeah, you know, so yeah. to tune into someone's humour is actually quite a highly functioning skill. Yes. To, to tell a joke that fits that the person your audience is actually quite skillful. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It requires I mean, an assessment first, doesn't it? An empathy yeah, and empathy and understanding and cultural yeah. dexterity. Yeah, yeah, and it's complex. You know, it, it's mm. it's really complex because you've got to. 
you know, you can't assume that you understand people or mm. you can get the humour right. And mm. there is a massive cultural component to it. Mm. Um, and, you know, when you, when you research humour, you're essentially entering into kind of ethnographic study by looking at um, mm. demographics, looking at cultures, looking at people mm. and how they, um, you know, kind of work with each other and, and form bonds with each other. And I mean, humour goes wrong when you're not reading the room correctly. Yeah. That, that's the thing. And, or you're not reading the person yeah. correctly. And that's um, one of the things that can make it so funny when you see something happening that's really awkward. I'm yeah. sure we've all done it. You, you go out with a blinder and it just is like, oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you see somebody else do it and you feel for them because we've all been there. We've all done that thing where we try and sort of eat tension and it's the wrong time. Oh, absolutely. And I think particularly when you're a young practitioner, maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, because you're right, you know, humour is is used as a therapy, which is an interesting idea as well. This idea that you can have laughter therapy, which yeah. I always find a bit odd. The thing, it feels a bit too formalised for my taste, but whatever, if it makes someone feel better. And then yeah. you've got studies saying that it actually reduces pain in some people, which I think is also really, really interesting. This idea that it's actually a kind of cognitive function of connection, which actually reduces physical distress, which is again looking at the kind of complexity of it. But what sort of um, if, if if you had a, a new practitioner, be a mental health or a nurse or social worker, who was saying to you, you know, when when can I use humour? When should I just? <laughs> what would you say the basic rules are for that? I think well, I suppose I, I think back to my early days in practice as a social worker, I suppose, and 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 how I've perhaps grown to understand people as the years have gone by. I think it's about just kind of checking out the temperature of what's going on around you really and whether it feels safe to do something. And if you feel yourself that it, it, it isn't okay to do it, then just don't do it. Use your own gut feeling really around that. Um, but most of the time, you know, if you're working with somebody who is really struggling with a particular situation. Say, for example, someone's really upset about something or feeling particularly low about something. Um, you know, a little bit of uh, humour actually goes down really well, and people quite like that. Um, but again, you've got to you've got to kind of measure it and, and read that. But I would just say test it out. You know, you, the, the whole beauty of practice is if we get things wrong, we learn from it and, and we try to get things better or at mm. least right next time. Um, I mean, there's loads of examples of when I have used humour to a devastating effect. <laughs> devastating good or devastating bad? Devastating bad. bad. <laughs> yeah, never, never devastatingly good, it has to be said, where, okay. I, where it completely backfired on me and mm. I've caused offence and upset and... And um, forward to the rest it, of this chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And I've got it completely wrong. Um, but you learn from that and you just think to yourself, yeah, you know, you've just got to kind of put some checks and measures in there. Um, but I think most of the time people people want to laugh about something and it does, it relieves tension. It's a great tension reliever. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. some people say humour is the best medicine. It quite often is, really. I think what you say about going slowly is really important. You know, if you think you can fly, start from the pavement, don't start from the 20th floor. You know, so sort of edge, edge into it. And I, I think as well, if somebody is distressed or angry, don't go there. Don't yeah. think, oh, we can we can laugh it off. Don't, yeah. don't go there. Absolutely. Particularly if it's someone you don't know that well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's I mean, that's something that you pick up on. If you if you're mm. an outsider and you're watching someone use humour and it is going wrong, mm. usually what you're seeing is is the individual who's trying to be humorous isn't mm. reading the the environment. They're not yeah. picking up on it and they're not knowing when to stop either and then just you know people dig a hole for themselves which I've, I've done several times by trying to then get out of the joke i'm telling or the the humorous um situation um but that's often whole, my favorite part of a joke gone wrong though watching watching someone dig their way through to australia <laughs> i quite enjoy that yeah. <laughs> thinking is someone going to step in here and stop this well it's yeah exactly it should be me and it will it be <laughs> And it becomes, um, it's almost addictive. It's, it's, it's like yeah. watching um, something really horrific unfolding in front of you, really. Everyone's drawn to that kind of thing, you know, when something yes. goes wrong. And, and as, a, as a lecturer, you see that a lot because if, if a student, for example, says something which might be a bit edgy or other students might think, you know, oh, I don't know if they should be saying that. Yeah, you, you feel think, it. You feel it and, you, and you, you get every student look at you. They look at you. Yeah. 
to find out what you're going to do. Yeah. 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 So the thing I enjoy the most is, suppose you've got, um, back in the days when we used to have classrooms, everyone would be sort of sat like this. And then someone would say something edgy and everybody would just isolate that person. And they'll be like, they're all alone in the room. Even though no one technically moved, you could just see everyone. Yes. Like, yeah. oh no, exactly. poor guy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you can, you know, if, if you can then use that, Mm. Um, to then have a humorous moment, you know, you might then laugh with the person mm. about something. Um, but again, you got to you got to read that. So there is something about permission as well. So when you were saying like that, you, your chair broke. You, you, it's there, there's the embarrassment factor there. That sometimes people laugh just because it's a social reaction, isn't it? And often those are not good times to laugh. But yeah. also that checking checking out to see how you're going to respond to it. But also if you're hurt, because everyone's had the urge to laugh and then actually, oh my god, they actually are quite seriously hurt. So there is. A lot of different factors going on when you decide whether to laugh or not or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And um, yeah, and it's all about communication. I mean, all that mm. comes from communication. All that comes from, from you know, looking at the person who's been aggrieved by something or looking at how other people are laughing about something. Mm. And um, and th- this is when, you know, people get the giggles and then people laugh mm. about things because it's this ripple effect, isn't it, across the room. Um, particularly in social work, you know, social workers try really hard to understand people to the best of their ability. You know, social mm-hmm. work is all about working with people during very difficult times to try and help mm-hmm. people to understand their own situations. So mm-hmm. I, I would say that the best social workers I know are the ones who use humour really well and find things really funny. Mm-hmm. When people who use services and laugh with people, don't laugh at people, and. And it's a great way also of managing power imbalances as well. Absolutely. So that's, that's I think, really important with what you're saying about, you know, punching up, not punching down. You know, it's not funny to laugh at because you've got a power gradient going down. Laughing no. with somebody or having a joke with somebody is fine. And laughing at your boss is always acceptable. Of course. Don't get caught. Don't get caught. <laughs> Don't get caught. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think that, that's right. And it, it, Well, I suppose it also it's about vulnerability as well and it's Mm. about being able to articulate a defense for yourself i don't necessarily you know we talk about punching up and and you could you could even argue from an equality perspective should humor be punching anybody regardless of what power position they're in but there is a privilege that comes with power which is you often have the mechanism to defend yourself and to maybe do something back to kind of you know try and have one of those kind of touche moments mm. um but you know people who are, who are particularly vulnerable in a particular situation laugh with you know that, that's that's the important part there um but also as well you know individuals um who are really struggling at any particular given time for something um may want permission to punch up and maybe need to support that as well i guess because you know, mm-hmm. if, if an individual is very aggrieved by something and is really struggling with something, they might want to actually crack a joke about the person that's aggrieving them. Should you then be laughing with that person uh, or saying, hang on, that's not really a good thing to do? Um, I don't have a problem necessarily with laughing with people about mm-hmm. other people if it supports that individual through a particular moment. Yeah, yeah. So we're kind of getting to the stage where we're thinking about humour maybe sometimes as something kind of dangerous as well i mean every time you sort of see um the risks associated with humor and also the fact that people in power really like to be laughed at really like it yeah, yeah. isn't it even the plot of the name of the rose the most dangerous book in the world is actually a book of humor oh, yeah, yeah, yeah something like that yeah well it is yeah. i mean there's, there's loads i mean i've got loads of books on humor and um you know, I mean, one particular good book is, is the most semi by Peter McGraw and Joel Warren of the Humour Code, and and mm. it talks about understanding when when humour is okay or not really. But for me, um, I mean, at the moment, there's a big thing about offensive humour, and offensive humour needn't be toxic humour. And and what I'm looking at quite a bit in in my literature um, search is that toxic humour kind of essentially has three strands to it, really. You know, it's humour that denigrates, it maligns people, mm. and it belittles people. And I suppose the question you've got to ask yourself if, if those things are happening is, is it actually funny? You know, is mm. that funny? Mm. Um, but does it serve another purpose? I mean, an example of that, Nicky, is, um, you know, Ricky Gervais, when he was, when he does his, um, you know, he was doing his Golden Globes introduction. Oh, yeah. 
right? Now, what's interesting about that is, is there were no jokes. He didn't tell any jokes. It was just insult after yes. insult after insult. But what made, I think, that funny for people was it released some kind of tension, a nervous tension, and people laugh at those kind of jokes because it, it, it people might find it funny because um, it releases you to do something a bit risque and a bit edgy. So it's kind of a psychological release to maybe laugh at something which others might feel, or even your own barometer says you shouldn't be laughing at. Um, but is there anything funny about really belittling somebody from mm. a particular group? Probably not. Mm. But does it feel good to laugh about that? Some people might say, yes, it does. So it serves a psychological function. So Ricky Gervais, for example, would say, well, actually, we have a right to say things that are offensive mm. um, and have a right to laugh about those things. But it's certainly not something I would um in a lecture, start getting into the realms of putting it that way. The, the, the different types of uh, experience, though, aren't they? I mean, if a lecturer stood at the front of a, a group of students who paid nine grand for the privilege and basically laid into the way they look, who they love, how much they earn, all that would be a problem. It would be a problem be because we... Yeah, because we that's not our function. Our function yeah. is about um, supporting and growth and things like that. But I think what's interesting about the Ricky Gervais stuff is basically he's do, he's got the privilege of the fool. Do you know that, that what I mean by that? That yeah. idea of that if somebody has like the court jester role, they can speak truth to power. They can say what they want. So when he sort of looks at George Clooney and he was making jokes about when I mean, he was in that space movie and he was saying, oh, my God, George Clooney's been trapped in a sort of confined space with a woman his own age. He's had to blast himself into space because it's so appalling for him. No. <laughs> it was just like, at the time, he was like dating some waitress or something who's like 20. And and basically, he's just said something that's absolutely true. Yeah. And that would, I would imagine, mm. be a challenge for a lot of the people in that audience to sort of sit and tolerate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not really, the purpose of it is not really to to make people laugh like a joke, is it? It's not about making people feel comfortable. It's about using his privilege to, which is, you know, his position, mm. to explore discomfort, which mm. really wouldn't be a nurse or social worker's role. Mm. So when we use humour, we're using it in a completely different way, I think, as and in education as well. I think I think we are. Social to, commentary almost, isn't it? Under yeah, yeah. That, that's right, yeah. And we, we also haven't got the money to defend ourselves in the law of court like he has. He's just <laughs> got sued or something, but... Uh, but I mean, it's not our place to do that, but maybe it's our place to also try and build resilience in mm. individuals or with individuals by mm. using humour to kind of um, enable people to gain strength in themselves. Mm. Um, you know, and I remember, I remember working with a student once who was very upset by a service user who was very unwell and he was, um, you know, um, he was detained under the mental health phase, a very unwell man who was just saying things to the student that were really upsetting. And, you know, and I said to her, that's not okay. And, and I'm really sorry that happened. And, you know, I don't um, uh, condone at all what, what happened there, but it is something that does happen when people are very unwell um, sometimes mm. and, and you're working with people within the realms of the mental health act. So building resilience to that is actually something that's really important. And afterwards mm. we actually did laugh about it. Mm. And, you know, when the student was actually able to laugh about it, we did laugh about it because there were some things that he said which were, you know, post-event. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Interest, really. Some of the things that have been said to me in practice are... <laughs> yes. Yeah, you look I mean, I've, I've always quite enjoyed that side of it, but I know that there are a lot of people who find it really difficult. Yeah. But yeah. I guess right. one of the things we're talking about with humour is this idea that you can give a difficult message. It's almost like a sugar coating for a difficult message. So when Ricky Gervais uses it, he uses it in that kind of like sledgehammer social commentary way. But right. in a therapeutic setting, you might use it in a way to help somebody to understand or learn or grow or challenge something that maybe they find difficult because yeah. you're not pricking pomposity, are you, in those some circumstances? You're, you're being very gentle with it. Yeah, you can yeah. use it quite like a scalpel, can't you? Rather than a yeah, and I think big chopping knife. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think so. And I think some of the, the greatest comedians, you know, if I think if I look at the comedians that I like, mm. um, they they were all really complex people, mm. and um, their humour supported them and enabled them to kind of get a sense of connectedness with themselves and, and the world around them and to understand the world around them. Um, you know, you look at someone like Kenneth Williams, for example, who was, who, mm. uh, was a really, really funny man. 
in his own time and his own space, he found very little funny. In fact, he was a mm. really tortured soul and really, really struggled with depression. And, mm. um, you know, um, it was believed he died by suicide in, you know, mm. in, in the 80s. So, but his humour, he, he, he understood he, his world through his humour. Mm. And he used self-denigrating humour really, really well in order to connect with people so most of his humor was about his physical health problems and he was quite open about those mm. um so understanding humor and understanding mm. how you connect with humor really is therapeutic for your own thinking mm. and your own mind because it connects you with who you are as a person mm. and it connects you with other people as well mm. um, we need to come to dave i think in a little bit because there's some um, questions coming in and i'm sure you haven't had a chance to say anything yet did, did you want to pop in? Yeah, I, I, I suppose I, I've been thinking lots about the stuff that you've been saying so far. And I think one of the things that I was really interested in is this idea about how we, we as health professionals or as social care professionals can create space to use humour positively for ourselves, but actually do it in a way that doesn't kind of insult or doesn't cause problems or, you know, upset the people that we're caring for. Uh, and just to give you an example, when I was a student nurse uh, on a, I think it was a cardiac ward and a nurse came into the breakout room and just said some really kind of, you know, what you could say was awful things about one of the patients that he was looking after. Actually, I think it was a relative that uh, he was looking after. Uh, and kind of, you know, he was actually someone I knew, you know, from outside of that. And I kind of said, you know, it's someone I know that. Uh, and it was just interesting that kind of bit about how do we get off our chests, you know, when we feel so distressed and upset about things, but do it, you know, kindly, sensitively, not to, to kind of, you know, cause insult to people. And, and at the end of the day, remember that if we are sort of making fun of people that we're caring for, how would we feel if those people heard that, you know, when it is in a breakout mm -hmm. room? So I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, Matt. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, I, I, it's to me, it's about knowing what your space is and knowing where you can say certain things. And it's a really, it's a really, really difficult one because I would say that you know, as professionals, you, you've you've got to use your professional space professionally. It might be a sense that you use your outside space um, in a way to release some of that tension. Um, now. Would it? Would I, for example, feel able to say, if you are going to say things about people, just make sure people aren't listening. You know, that that probably wouldn't be good professional advice because <laughs> there's something there about your own inner values and whether or not actually, um, you know, should you be doing those things in, in, anyway. Um, but it's just about being sensible and it's just about knowing who's there and what is okay and what what isn't okay to say. But I suppose, you know, we all have our own inner thoughts. And, um, you know, in fact, I was reading um, um, some, some research earlier on about some of the functions of toxic humour, which is what you might be kind of describing there, um, Dave, really. And, um, and it, it, it's a way for people to release prejudice and to check in with their own prejudices and their own thoughts around that. Um, and people actually say that, that using toxic humour, or at least engaging in toxic humour, supports them to really check out the things they struggle with so that maybe they can try and rectify that and do something about that um supervision social workers are really really good at supervision and you know social work the social work profession probably are the champions of, of really good supervision and using supervision really really well in practice and and i know <coughs> a lot of fantastic social work managers out there and, and senior practitioners advanced practitioners who use supervision and say to their their supervisees you know, this is safe space to talk about things, but you've got to know where that line is in the sand as a professional social worker and just not engage in things that are cruel or nasty. Mm. Um, but I think it would be naive to say that some conversations in supervision um, don't get close, but I would think that the supervisor or the supervisee probably manage that and, 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 and you know, kind of check that out really and say we need to kind of not, not go there with that one. Yeah, and, and I think that 
that's really good advice there. And I suppose while you were talking, I was just thinking about Mickey's role as, as a lecturer, you know, about how you can kind of, you know, when students do, do say things that are inappropriate, how you can kind of pull them back from that brink and to sort of support them so they realise that the impact that that has. And, and just thinking about, you know, I've been doing quite a bit of work at a vaccination centre with lots of people that are now working in the NHS but have only recently come into the NHS and are saying, you know, at times inappropriate things to members of the public who are coming in to, you know, receive healthcare. And there's times where you just so desperately wished you hadn't overheard what they've said, because then you wouldn't have to do anything about it. But hearing it as a health professional and, and kind of saying, well, actually, that isn't appropriate what you've just said. And, you know, can you just make sure you don't say that in future? And how you do that in a way where you're not kind of, you know, destroying people's, the, you know, the, the kind of the bridges and everything. But you're doing it in a way that makes it clear that, you know, we've got to treat people with respect because that's what we all deserve so I, I don't know Nick have you got any thoughts in terms of you know when you come across students that have kind of I think that? there's a couple of things isn't it if you're in an environment where to well people call it toxic humor don't they where it's just brutal that for me is a sign that you know, this is not that's not a laughing matter for me because I've been through systems like that and it's get the heck out particularly for young practitioners I know it sounds really awful and you should always you know, absolutely always report it but don't don't stay and become corrupted by it that cruelty that unkindness that burnout that tiredness you know it, it's too much for one person to change by themselves particularly if they're a junior practitioner <clears throat> so my advice would be is you know see it like the canary in the coal mine if you're seeing that kind of humor which is it's i mean everyone can make an ill time joke everyone can be frustrated but if you're seeing constant bullying and harassment dressed up as comedy it isn't yeah, and, and I, I, I think one of the things I would say as well is that, you know, I, I think, Nikki, you're such a great example of someone who's hilariously funny, but really kind with it. And, you know, I, I, I remember sort of... A bit worried now about what's going to happen now. <laughs> but, no, no, but, but I, 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 do, I do think that some people just get it right and other people get it really wrong. So, but isn't yeah. that something, I, when you say about feeding back, isn't that just like any type of communication? No, any time when you're getting really close emotionally to people, and that's what comedy is, isn't it? You were saying about that it's a, a, community, a connection between people, yeah. particularly a connection based on sort of shared values. If you're making that connection and you misjudge it you apologize like you would do if you accidentally stepped on someone's foot yeah. you know it's stepping on someone's feelings isn't really that much different if you keep doing it then the person could quite legitimately suggest that you're just someone who stamps on them and it's not exactly yeah. it's not okay but if the odd stumble and blunder is human isn't it yeah and you know apologize and you know when you've upset someone you know you know yeah. you, you and know you also can tell if someone was just clumsy or whether they meant to be rude when I was working in practice at the end, you know, when you, I was, at the end, sounds terrible. Um, I'd started work for a trust and then like seven years later, I'd still got the same badge. So you can imagine that the fresh faced person who bounced in after having a year in America, Australia, which is what I'd had at the time, to the person who staggered out the other end of those seven years, I looked quite different. And one of the uh, services I met in the corridor, I said, oh, you know, it's my last day today. And he says, just as well, it's just as well. I was looking at your badge and this place has robbed you of your youth. I was like, that oh, has, it really has. <laughs> but it was like, it wasn't meant unkindly. It was an abject description of like the Jekyll and Hyde thing that was going on looking at these two pictures. It was just like, it literally was like my, my identity badge had become like the picture of Dorian Gray. It was yeah. terrifying. <laughs> but it was done with a humorous intent, wasn't it? Was it was done with just perfect done. honesty. That's what yeah. makes it so funny. Yeah, the Sometimes when you're talking to people and they don't have that filter, that's right, yeah, and that's that's what it's so to me. It's you know, yeah. it's, not, it's about is it actually funny? What's the purpose of it? And I mean, there have been times when I've I've you know called people out and I've said, yeah, but what you're saying it's not even funny. It's just it's just unpleasant. It's not even mm. funny. And so if you're trying to make a joke of something um, that is really stabbing someone mm. uh, in the heart and and kind of really bringing that person down, yeah. at least try and have a purpose to it and make it funny. You know, otherwise you just completely fail comedian there, so just pack it up. But it goes back, you know, back to what you said earlier on about is this the role for you? If your um you know, if your thoughts about people that, that professionals work with is to, you know, um just reduce and denigrate and be unpleasant about, then this is not the job for you as a practitioner, really. Mm. Um but but you know, it's and, and again, you know, I, I mean I remember vividly um some while back a student said to me, can I ask a stupid question? And I said, 
um, don't forget, there's no such thing as a stupid question, just stupid people. And um, and the look I got made me realise that perhaps I shouldn't have said that. But inwardly, I kind of thought it was a bit funny because mm -hmm. it wasn't aimed at that student or anyone else. It's something that I heard. Mm -hmm. And when I heard, I really laughed at the person saying it. But I didn't quite get the reaction myself. So again, was was it toxic? I I don't think it don't was. Think it's toxic. Toxic. No, was it offensive? I think they were offended, so probably mm. a little bit. Mm. Um, would I do it again? Maybe. Would I read the room better? Absolutely. So you know, they're, they're, with that, try try fail fail better. That's your model. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Ex exactly. So one of one of the things before because I'm sure there's some comments that that Dave wants to bring in from from people watching. But one of the things I think the best use of humour in mental health is service users about services and staff. The number of people who are service user reps, people, because we had the radical zines on, we had Asylum magazine on, we made mention of Dolly Sen's amazing, amazing gags. Mm -hmm. um, all those sorts of things I think are really important. And if if you take nothing from this, please, please look up, you know, kind of the radical zines stuff, look up um, people who rightly call out services for their insensitivity sometimes um my, we were talking last year one of the, my favorite favorite dolly sen artworks installations activisms is the trip advisor uh, review of the maudsley hospital <laughs> which is, is sweet because i'm so glad it never happened to me i would have hated it to happen to me but i do think it's funny when it happens to somebody else <laughs> so, yeah. but it, it's beautiful because it's absolutely punching up it's absolutely making a really interesting point it doesn't take out anybody personally but it says quite a lot about the issues the issues and about expectations and about human experience and all those things that are really important it's clever it's smart it's funny and um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I like to see. And it's intelligent and it's appropriate. And, you know, I've got, I've got memories of um, service users and patients in, in mental health wards absolutely kind of some corkers. I mean, really funny observations about services. Mm. Um, and I'm, and I think it's, I think it's just great to see. And, I, you mm. know, and I, it's great that we've got so much writing about it at the moment um, from a service user perspective. Mm. Yeah. It's really important, I think, in, in terms of balancing power out. It's very important to consider whether you deserve the power that you have. And I think one of the things that when you when you read critiques of you know how it might feel, how this experience might feel for somebody else, it really changes the way that you can hear that information. You know, sometimes if you just get a critique of, you know, this is this is not good, that's a problem, this is an issue, it can be quite hard to take the information on. But yeah. I think when you read just the points that people make and quite rightly raise, quite legitimately raise, yeah. um, yeah. I was. I remember saw a touching the other day that was about um, saying, you know, a cup of tea in a bath is the mental health nurse's version of thoughts and prayers. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it was just it was just stuff about that kind of just gentle sort of chiding, bringing you back to yourself, stopping yourself being so kind of grandiose about you know practice and remembering what your role is, which is to support people, not to lord it over them. Mm, mm, mm. Dave, is there anything that the people are saying on online? There is. I was very terrible last time because instead of sort of bringing those questions in, I just sort of talked about my own thoughts. So did let's actually, cycle back. Yeah, good. Thank <laughs> you. Let let let's kind of go to to the public now. So uh, Lois, uh, they've said that you're fab. So you know, good sort of support from a colleague. Uh, I'm assuming from you, Clan. So uh, you know. Uh, I'm sure you want to hear that. Uh, yeah, nice. uh, Great. <laughs> uh, and then we've had a few comments from Alfonso. Uh, obviously, Alfonso is a friend of the show uh, from Italy. So, He's yeah. talked about uh, how humour is so interesting from a cultural perspective. I remember when I moved to London from Italy, I struggled with British humour. But after 13 years here, I couldn't live without it. Uh, it's certainly something that we think that we're very proud of in terms of British humour. So I suppose it's good to hear that someone from another country agrees with that. Right, yeah. uh, we've got Lovelace. She's made a few comments. Uh, humour, especially from culture, can be very funny. I laugh a lot if it's something I don't understand through communication. Uh, but also, uh, Lovelace, I think this would be punching... Is that punching up? I think because she's saying that Rory is is hilarious. I, I've met oh, yeah. Rory and and I can confirm that as well. That's true. Uh, so uh, and then the other thing, Alfonso's coming with a question. 
Uh, there's two questions I wanted to raise with you. So this is the first one. Uh, do you think that humour is discipline specific? I mean, we use a lot of humour in mental health within professional boundaries, of course. Would other disciplines, professionals use humour in their jobs teaching? So is there any difference? Well, the other one I want you to think about is from Helen Spandler, who's a guest from last week. And she says, great episode. What do you think of Fraser's comeback? I don't think I know what that is. Am I showing my real ignorance there? So just two questions for you to take there. Right, yeah. Um, so what was the first, so what was the first one from Alfonso? I'm sorry. So Alfonso was saying... Discipline specific. Right, discipline specific. Um, I don't think it is. I think it... I, but I think you, you learn... I think you... I think you learn to become part of your professional culture. So if you have that kind of humour, you might end up losing it. Um, I mean, I've only ever worked in social care. I think mental health social workers have a particularly dry sense of humour. Um, and I've only ever worked in mental health social work. And um, there's something that there's a culture, I think, in, in mental health um, social work of, of, of dry humour and seeing, um, seeing things that, shouldn't be funny are probably funny um and i can't i mean i can't really give any examples of that but i suppose it's just kind of um laughing at the silliness of psychiatry sometimes i think social workers sometimes laugh at the silliness of language within psychiatry so for example when you know perhaps doctors talk about non-compliance social workers might laugh at that and say oh, hang on a minute you know using non-compliant isn't that actually someone just making their own self-determining choice? And they might just laugh about that and, and think that's quite amusing. Um, I, I don't know, really. I mean, I, I, nurses, I think nurses are a good laugh sometimes. I've, I've had a laugh with a couple of nurses before. Not many, not many, but some. And um, uh, doctors, are doctors funny? Maybe sometimes. Is it, I mean, is it, is it discipline specific? Um, I, I'm not sure it is, but I think there are types of humour that align to certain roles. I think um, That's interesting, and and you see that in mental health teams um, quite a bit. I think, particularly amongst the social workers, in mm. my experience, yeah. I think there's something about the exposure to kind of the raw side of humanity, which <clears throat> which brings out a desperate need to laugh sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I've had days in nursing where I've I've laughed and I've cried like heartily, yeah. Yeah. Uh, almost at the same time, yeah. because what you see is funny and awful and tragic and amazing. And it's a lot to emotionally process. And you're right, we don't always spend the time that we should yeah. getting supervision and those other things. Yeah. But also, you know, the function of humour is is connective, it's bonding, isn't it? So it's natural for it to happen very much so in close teams. Like it is, you have like family sense of humours. You, know, you have friend friend groups have very specific sense of humours or catchphrases or things like that, which bring you together. And that's one of the jobs yeah. of it isn't it yeah, that's right yeah and and you want to in laugh. jokes think of in jokes running jokes yeah yeah, yeah indeed yeah and and the, the you know the, the the team um you know the team office camaraderie is really important as well because life is so ridiculous isn't it life is so ridiculous but it's 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 more ridiculous for, for some people some people have just really difficult lives mm. and um everything is a challenge because life is so unfair and unequal um, mm. And the only way that you can often guide someone through a really, really difficult moment in their life is when you finish doing that piece of work, just to have a laugh about something, um, we, you know, with mm. colleagues about that. Um, but I, I mean, I, th I've, I think I've been very lucky to work with lots of people who find lots of things funny, you know, mm. um, and I've, I feel very privileged to have shared my professional um, career with service users who have really made me laugh because they are just naturally intelligent, funny people who have said some fantastic things or have a character about them which is naturally funny because um, they just do things, uh, people might do things, for example, that um, just 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 are humorous, you know, or say things that are humorous and individuals laugh themselves at that. Um, so I feel very I feel very fortunate. And, and at UCLan, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people at UCLan that make me laugh. Helen Spanner is one of them because mm. Helen's a good laugh and Helen actually... Um, was pivotal in me thinking about the subject of humour. Mm. Um, so what do you think of the Fraser comeback? Fraser is coming back. You know Fraser? Oh, Fraser, the, the TV programme, yeah. I never. It better have I, Niles. If it doesn't have Niles, what's the point? No, is it? Yeah. Well, also, do um, we need another, you know, forgive me, guys, old white guy comedy stuff? <laughs> do, well, you know, do we need it? Yeah. <laughs> do we? 
like I everything that it. was, it was very monocultural, wasn't it? It was very intellectual. It was, it was great, but it was, it was also, very 90s. Yeah, very 90s and very typical American comedy in as much as they always have to explain the joke. Mm. Now, I think, to go back to Dave's, Dave's point about um, Alfonso said about British culture, one thing that's quite good with British humour is, is, that, is that Brits don't often explain the joke. So in, oh, in thank com- God, I can't bear I mean, it. Comedy, if, you look, if you look at Brit comedy, they will leave a joke hanging because the beauty of understanding that joke is you work it out yourself. But if you want to, if you want to get a classic example of explaining the joke, Friends is the one. They always have to explain the joke, Friends, and it irritates me. Mm. Let it hang. Mm. Mm. I think for me, the thing that made me laugh the most probably was what we do in the shadows. I've, I loved the movie, and I've loved the TV series. They're filming another one now. The werewolves, yeah. not swearwolves. <laughs> I still thinking about that kind of Antipodean to Kiwi Australian kind of sense of humor. Well, I think goes very similar to kind of Brit humor. It does, and and another thing I think we're really good at as well um, in the UK is humor that's also got pathos within the same yeah. the same moment. Um, yeah. You know, where there's sadness and humor working together mm. to make you laugh at the absurdity of life. Mm. And, Steptoe and Son, Gordon Simpson, mm. Steptoe and Son was brilliant for that. Mm. And Ricky Gervais in credit to him with Afterlife and mm. The Office. There was sadness there, moments of great hilarity as well. I think Afterlife, I really like Afterlife. It just makes me laugh. Mm. Um, but it's also really sad as well. Mm. So and there's some cute humour that pushes too far. I just, I find it too painful to watch. So yeah. there was an episode with Steve Coogan. Um, he was obviously being Alan, what's his, What's the character he plays, the radio Alan guy? Partridge. Alan Partridge. Yeah. And he was on a date, which was already agonising to watch. And they ended up going to a bird sanctuary. And there's just this kind of owl sort of tied to a stick in the middle of this field with the wind coming in horizontally and raining. And he's trying to like seduce this woman who was so awful. I just got to watch it. It took me, I was just so emotionally uncomfortable. I just felt for the guy so much. Just don't we all know an Alan Partridge? I mean, we all we all know an Alan Partridge, don't we? Or a David yeah. Brent. Everybody knows yeah. that that awkward. Uh, <laughs> it might be me. I'm a bit David Brent like. I think I'm funnier than I am. I wasn't pointing at you. <laughs> I think I am. I think I am. But we all know we all know a David Brent, and we all know an Alan Partridge, don't we? We all know an individual that actually um, does just ridiculous things that we just find funny when they're not actually meaning to be funny. Um, but a, a good part will get you a long way, I think. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, Fee Bastos online saying that she's been revisiting all the classic um, uh, sitcoms too and loved Afterlife. But there's something as well, I think, about the familiarity of an old an old show that made you laugh before, that the kind of humour takes you back to that place as well, that warmth, that yeah, comfort. Yeah. So rather than sort of like branching out on some new, kind of incredibly trying and challenging experience, a lot of people have been comfort watching. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And um, it does, it, it connects you with um, the time that you were watching it. So, you know, I, I always, if I watch some of the old 1970s stuff or the 80s stuff, you know, um, you know, Tommy Cooper, for example, I think of my dad, who I was mm. really close to, and he died a few years ago. Mm. My dad thought Tommy Cooper was hilarious, and I think Tommy Cooper was hilarious. So when I watch Tommy Cooper, I laugh really with Tommy Cooper, but I also think of my dad laughing as well. So mm. it, it, it really is a wonderfully psychological function on every yeah. level. Um, but one of the things I wanted to say about that, though, and I think it's interesting to, about, you know, you can look back and, and, and remember old favourites. that, Like me and my wife uh, watched Hello, Hello again at the start of lockdown because that's something wow. that we loved as kids. Uh, and, you know, it was so great to watch it again, but some parts of the humour you thought, no, actually... That's that's really not right, and you know some really. You, you just want to kind of wish that you hadn't watched it again because it tarnished yeah. some of the memories, and and I think again it's that bit for me about it's important that if we do revisit things, we we kind of we we do look at it through a new lens, and we do mm-hmm. actually think you know maybe we did find it funny the first time, but it, it's it's not it's not a time for this comedy anymore, and, and we need to put it away. And I know there was a big kind of national debate about Faulty Towers and how, you know, really inappropriate some of that humour was. Mm. Uh, so I, I suppose, you know, it, it's that kind of bit, isn't it, about we, we should we should revisit, and but also throw away the things that aren't appropriate anymore, shouldn't we? Yeah, well, um, like, and you know better, do better, isn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, it, the things, I mean, comedy um, doesn't age well um, and because it's it's cultural and it's about the demographic, it's about the standards and the views of the time. I mean, some people would say, don't you dare touch the classics, you know, don't you dare not st- not show 40 Towers. I mean, there were some absolute classic moments in 40 Towers, but it doesn't age well. It hasn't aged well. A lot of comedy hasn't aged well. Um, should we in it and then engage in the council culture um i i'm i'm not sure because i think we need to learn from that if you want to look if you want to know where we're going i think you've got to know where we've come from um and i don't think we can just erase um certain elements of comedy that are out there um but no it doesn't age well i mean and i don't and i don't find things funny that i thought thought funny then i mean i remember mm. as a kid my family laughing hysterically at jim davidson and mm. Bernard Manning, you know, and and the thought <laughs> the thought mm. now of 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 um, me thinking is that funny now kind of fills me with a bit of fear, really, because I think to myself, gosh, what what what's what's shifted in my own thinking to make me now realise that perhaps that isn't okay, you know. But don't forget, um, you know, it's gone differently as well. I remember being a kid and seeing stuff like, but not the nine o'clock news with Constable yeah. Savage. Yeah. And that must have been what the early eighties. Yeah, yeah. And they were absolutely calling out racism in the police force, brutality, mm-hmm. inappropriate stop and search, and it was spot on. You know, when it, when the one guy, one poor uh, guy, gets arrested for uh, loitering with intent to use a public crossing, and he's just like pressing the button waiting for the green man, and it's just, and 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 they kind of, that kind of cut straight through. So there are people I think who who lead the way in terms of comedy. Mm. You know, they absolutely call stuff out and they 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 mm. really raise important issues. So I think when we all just look back and say, oh, there's some dodgy stuff gone down. Well, yeah, yeah. But because it's because people are in it and there's some good stuff and some bad stuff. And yeah. some stuff has absolutely changed the way that that the society thinks and what society thinks is yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Usually only- changed it. You know, when absolutely. you like a comedian, you tend to or or a performer, you know, kind of daytime television type like comedy you can you can leverage that personhood can't you see the people so when you look at sort of you know people who have come out lgbt and stuff like that when they have really raised that issue when they've been liked and then all of a sudden it changes somebody who doesn't know anybody or they think they don't know anybody who has that sexuality and then all of a sudden it changes things for them because they're laughing and they're smiling that goodwill spills over and it changes the way they see society that stuff is huge and people have gone out on some real limbs to actually make people think differently or challenge what people think is okay. And just because the majority of people think something doesn't mean it's right, does it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Amazing stuff's happened in comedy. There there was absolutely amazing stuff. And I mean, the 80s was great for that. And there were some characters in the 70s as well who refused to be different. And, you know, Larry Grayson, who was huge, I loved as a kid because he he was just, he was naturally so funny. And he, Mm. he was a bit of a hero of mine, really, in terms of comedy because... He didn't mean to be anything other than who he was as, a, as an individual, you know, mm. uh, you know, a, a, a gay man who um, was uh, very uh, open about his his sexuality, um, but also um, had an intensely private life. But also, as well, um, it was hilarious. I mean, he just was he was funny in so much that he said and did, and refused to to not be who he was. Um, mm. But no, but I think I mean some of the situational comedy was 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 desperate in the seventies, really desperate. A lot of but, things were desperate in the seventies when you look back on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, indeed, yeah. On the buses, gosh, you know that was something I used to. Oh, Let's anyway. not even go there. Even go there. <laughs> Please, there are no buses anymore. <laughs> from on the buses, eh? What a character he was. So, um, Loveless Benia said at this present moment, thank God for people with humour posting funny videos. I have to say, I've been loving the memes. So many things helped me to calm down, particularly at the start of lockdown, when it suddenly felt like a shared joke, made, made me feel much more connected to community. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm a, I'm a fiend for a meme. I love them. Yeah. Yeah, some of them are great. And I like the videos as well that showed people being themselves. And have you seen the one of the, um, I think, yeah, she was a, a woman who was recently 100 years old who received a telegram, a, a card from the Queen, and uh, she opened it. It was filmed and, you know, perhaps expecting a... Uh, and an emotional response, and she opened it up, and uh, the, I think it was her care or relative said to her, "You got a card from the Queen," and she says, "She doesn't give a shite about me," and that just was funny because this because this woman has this 
card from the Queen, you know, and she says, oh, no, I care about this, not interested. And I, I thought that was funny. I've all been there. I hardly really care. <laughs> you have to have very strong, strong, strongness inside yourself yeah. to hold yourself together during a brutal assault from an elderly person. <laughs> and they've had, they've just had the practice. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we're going to get to the stage where we need to finish up. Is there anything, um, Dave, on social media that we need to sort of bring in? So we've talked about humour and mental health. We've talked about human wellness. We've talked about functions maybe that humour can serve, uh, benefits when it's toxic, some of the issues you might want to think about if you're a new practitioner. I wonder if maybe we can start to think about any sort of like last last ideas or things that we want to just finish on thinking. Well, there's, there's nothing that I can find that we've missed. So yeah, definitely over to Matt for his closing thoughts. We'll the, the epilogue, the closing thoughts from Matt. Gosh, well... Well, I, what would I say? I just would say is is don't be afraid to be humorous. Don't be afraid to say what you think. If you epically cock up with your humor, learn from it and adapt it um, and just keep laughing. You know, for goodness sake, folks, this is a really, really difficult, stressful time at the moment. Find things to laugh at and connect with people who are on the same humorous wave as you. And use your humor in practice. Use your humor to um, develop really good relationships with people we work with because service users and patients really deserve um, professionals that can engage with them in ways that are really meaningful and use humor as to, 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 to champion that. I think. Fantastic. Fantastic. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Hearing, sure. Hearing sure. Who's on next week, Dave? Uh, okay. It is the rethink to be confirmed question mark. So Vanessa uh -huh. is on the case to organise a great panel of guests for next week. So uh, yeah, fantastic. So there's something to look forward to there, and I hope you've really enjoyed that. I have to say, 50 minutes went really fast today. So thank you very much, Matt. Much appreciated. Yeah. And have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you guys. next time. Bye.